Hi, everybody. Welcome to Arizona Historical Society's Strategies for Teaching Black History. I'm Todd Bailey. I'm the Special Projects Coordinator at the Heritage Center in Papago Park. With me today is our Development Associate, Robert Fleck. Some helpful reminders. Please use the chat box to introduce yourself and please ask questions. Because of the number of participants, we encourage non-presenters to keep your video off and remain on mute for the duration of the program. Note that this event will be recorded. A link to the recording and a survey will be sent out to all participants. And remember, if you enjoy this program, please consider becoming a member at AH azhs.org slash membership. Our mission at Arizona Historical Society, connecting people through the power of Arizona history. The Arizona Historical Society is a nonprofit organization and a state agency established in 1864. There are four locations. There's the Pioneer Museum in Flagstaff, the Arizona Heritage Center in Papago Park in Tempe. There's the Arizona History Museum in Tucson and the beautiful Sanguinetti House in Yuma. We collect, preserve, and tell the story of Arizona's past through museum exhibitions, libraries and archives, historic sites, educational programs, and the Journal of Arizona History. We'd like to keep in touch with you. Please stay connected. Become a member, sign up for our email list, follow us on social media, and don't forget to order the cool new license plate. Visit azhs.org today. Our featured speakers today are Shelley Gordon and Lisa Olson, co-founders of the 1619 Project Advocates of Arizona. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to Shelley and Lisa. waiting for that to close out welcome everybody this is such an exciting day juneteenth for the first time in our nation's history we are honoring it as a federal holiday very exciting i certainly didn't expect that to happen this particular year when all of the voter suppression bills are going on right uh we are so thankful to the arizona historical society for this opportunity to hold an important conversation about teaching black history, which is American history in our schools. Uh, who we are. So Shelly and I are friends. We met in the space of social justice. She introduced me to the 1619 Project as it was published in the New York Times Magazine in 2019. She shared it with me March last year. And she said, what do you want to do with this? And I was blown away by it. And we decided we wanted to work to get this into our schools. So together for the last year, we've been putting together professional development series and meeting with educators around the state and around the country to find the best way to prepare teachers to bring this important and difficult history to our classrooms with sensitivity and respect. We started out as the 1619 Project Advocates of Arizona, and now a year later, we are formalizing ourselves as a nonprofit, and the name is going to be updated to Revealing Origin Stories of America, Rosa. So we think of Rosa Parks um, and Latina name, Rosa. So it's a great name for us to focus on. And we have found that the 1619 Project offers a fantastic portal into lots of other origin stories that have been missing from our American whitewashed textbooks. And so Shelley would like to share our mission. Yeah. Hi everyone. Uh, looks like somebody's trying to get in. I don't know if anyone's aware of that, but there's somebody in the waiting room, Kelly Rafford. Somebody could let her in, that would be great. So as Lisa said, you know, we came together because uh, just reading this magazine was really life altering for me. I never before had I considered that slavery, you know, the legacy of slavery had such an impact 
on our nation's history. Um, everything we think of in modern society has been affected by slavery, and you'll hear more about that from our, uh, our guests today. So uh, the mission, which is a work in progress, but uh, we are basically focused on professional development programs for teachers. So let me tell you what we, uh, what we wrote here. The mission of Revealing Origin Stories of America is really to prepare teachers in Arizona public schools to instruct their students in the multicultural historical truths of America that have either been minimized or have been missing altogether. Our aim is to position the 1619 Project as a foundational educational resource that challenges the dominant narratives about our nation's history and opens up the door to exploring all origin stories. So the 1619 Project is not the only story, but it really is a gateway to exploring all of them. To achieve this goal, we offer, as I said, professional development programs within a brave space to hold courageous conversations. We train teachers to educate their students in multicultural history and racial equity with sensitivity and respect. And we do this through immersion in primary source materials, uh, not textbooks. You know, we're talking about the Library of Congress, the Smithsonian, the Pulitzer Center, and a number of other uh, sources. And uh, as part of that, we are immersing teachers in inquiry, that whole methodology, and also teaching equity training, uh, or I'm sorry, training teachers in equity training, which we feel is an equal, equally important part of the professional development series. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. We would like to introduce our prestigious guests here today. We, we have been just delighted to collaborate with Christina Sneed in a couple of other capacities. We find her to be a brilliant teacher. She, she works in just outside of St. Louis, Missouri at uh, University City High School. And her bio is, she's a 10th year educator and has enjoyed three years of instructional coaching. She has recently transitioned into a new position as her St. Louis District's ELA Curriculum and Instruction Coordinator. Her teaching background has been in middle and high school English language arts and theater arts. Her educational background is in speech communication, training and development, and educational leadership. She resides with her husband and three children, two boys and a girl. The eldest son just graduated from high school. Welcome, Christina. And Christina's principal, uh, Mike, Mike Peoples, he's in the process of getting his PhD, so I hope the next time I see him, I can call him Dr. Peoples. <laughs> he is the principal of University City High School, just outside of St. Louis. Prior to his role as principal, Mike served as associate principal at Hazelwood East High School. Mike is a graduate of the University of Missouri from the Honors Program earning a BA in engineering management and working for Fortune 500 companies, including IBM and Saturn. He went on to earn his math and principal certifications from Lindenwood University and taught math in community college and high school. Mike also has a master's in teaching and social administration. And like I said, is currently working toward a PhD and that's happening at St. Louis University. In addition to being a math instructor and school principal, Mike has coached high school football and track and field. He's the proud father of six kids. Um, three of them are adult children, no longer eaten at his kitchen table. And the other three are still being raised. Uh, they live in a suburb of St. Louis, he and his wife and those three children. And we are so excited to welcome you today, Mike. Thank you for being here. And Thank everybody you. will notice that we do not have students on our right. panel today. As advertised, we, we expected students to be here, but as you can imagine, it's difficult um, corralling them in the summer. <laughs> so Christina <laughs> has brought the voices of a couple of those students here today in video format. And we are very excited to hear from two perspectives, from, edu from the educator, slash administrative perspective on bringing this history to the classroom, as well as from the student perspective as how it was received. And thank you both for your courage. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's start off with uh, the first question, which is probably on a lot of people's minds. So for those in the audience who 
I'm sure everyone is familiar with the 1619 Project. If you Google it, you'll find all kinds of mixed reviews or mixed opinions about it. So I'm gonna ask Christina, what is the 1619 Project and why do you, why do you think there is such opposition to it? Thank you, Shelley. Um, it's a pleasure to be with this audience today and to be able to discuss this very important work that I am very passionate about. Um, the 1619 Project is an initiative of the New York Times Magazine. It is the brainchild and labor of love of Nicole Hannah-Jones. And it began in August of 2019 in order to commemorate, to acknowledge the 400th anniversary of the beginning of American slavery, of chattel slavery. It aims to reframe the country's history by placing the consequences of slavery and the legacy it has left and the contribution of black Americans at the very center of our national narrative. So when you ask the question, why is that controversial or why is it being attacked? Because it aims to reframe the country <laughs> by placing the consequences of chattel slavery and the consequences, the contributions rather of the descendants of that system at the very center of the creation story of this country. So when we think of our national narrative of what we remember about how this country was created, it's very controversial to say that black Americans and the descendants of the enslaved should be considered the founding fathers of this country. That's very different than what we've been taught throughout our schooling and it's very different than the faces and the stories of the people we have been taught to revere as being our founding fathers. That's why it's being attacked. <laughs> so you can imagine that is, that is jarring to so many people that to even consider the possibility that at the genesis of our country is you know, enslaved, kidnapped enslaved people who built this country and the wealth that exists here. Lisa, so you, you, wanna... mentioned, you mentioned, Christina, that this was published in 2019, August, uh, to commemorate the 400 year anniversary. And you began pondering, as we understand, from that moment that you read, read this, that you were going to bring it to your classroom. So we understand you brought it to your classroom second semester of that year, so 2020. Um, and I'm just wondering, how did you introduce this material to your students? How did you start that conversation? Well, thank you for asking that question. Um, as soon as I heard about it, I was intrigued and I immediately started thinking, how am I going to introduce this to my students? Because I am an English teacher. I'm an ELA teacher. That is my background in speech and theater. Um, but I always believe that um, strong, rich, powerful text should be at the center of what we do in English. Um, and that doesn't, um, there are no walls between what types of text we should be putting before our students. So I saw it as a great opportunity to engage them and learning around an important topic um, and engaging with a rich and powerful text. So I started thinking of like how to make this relevant for them because anytime you talk about something that is dealing with hard history and controversial um, topics, you always have to find the in with students. How do you make it relevant to them? And so I just thought like, how do we talk about race in our, in our society? Like how do you broach that topic and whose responsibility is it to teach students, to teach young people about race? So I thought of using that as a driving question and creating a project-based learning unit where we would study the 1619 project in a project-based way where students would be able to dig deep into the work, think critically about the, the contents and then create a project at the end that really demonstrated their level of passion and understanding and connection to the text and to the real world in which they live. So uh, Mike, you know, Christina decided to be the trailblazer at uh, 
Hazelwood High School or University City High School, pardon me. And you know that this has some controversy, although Christina told us that she started teaching this in uh, actually during the pandemic in uh, 2020. So you as the principal of the high school, how did you react to her wanting to do this? Did you have one? Were you concerned? Did you, you, know, did you think about the community and their reaction? Mm -hmm. And thank, thank you, um, Shelly, and, and thank you to Lisa as well. Uh, and, and thank you for the opportunity to be with you today uh, to have this uh, very important and impactful conversation. Um, and, I, and in response to your question, um, I, I'd like to say, before I respond actually, um, to give full accolades to Mrs. Christina Steed and her brilliance um, related to her embracing this work. Um, her, her standards of work and her excellent are not um, typical. Uh, mm -hmm. She above and beyond in the interests of our students regularly. And it is a sincere privilege um, to have the opportunity to work with her. Um, to, I have watched and marveled at her work um, since she's been with us. And um, our students were very for, the very fortunate recipients of her efforts. Um, so with that being said, upon being informed of uh, Christina's desire to teach the 1619 Project, um, I responded with genuine enthusiasm. Um, I am a leader who's a little bit different. Um, I do not typically really at all allow fear in any way, shape, form, or fashion to drive my decision-making or thought around leading our school and our building. Um, while I know uh, that work would be met potentially with some opposition, I looked at this as an opportunity um, for our students to grow and be exposed to new and innovative and exciting learning. And also to be exposed to what is, I feel, a more authentic account of the history around um, the slave uh, American slaves and their contributions to our country. So I had no hesitation whatsoever. I was excited and embraced the opportunity. So I just want to acknowledge you for your courage and your stand because we know that Missouri is one of the states like Arizona mm -hmm. that is trying to keep this keep this from students, you know, keep these uh, origin stories away from students. And so Thank you for taking a stand. You know, we need way more people like you. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. yeah Thank you. so with that, in, in, with that in mind, I would ask um, how, what would be your advice, Mr. Mm -hmm. Peoples, to other administrators, principals, and superintendents that, that choose to onboard the 1619 Project? What would they need to know ahead of time in order to be good supporters of, of it? Um, and thank you for that question. And I'd also like to say that my circumstances were a little bit unique in that um, our incredible superintendent who is not with us today, Dr. Sharonica Harden Bartley, um, actually paved the way and created an opportunity for us to bring this learning and work to our district right. and actually approached the school and Christina Sneed initially with this opportunity. And in doing so, that made my work much easier um, <laughs> being that I had the support of our superintendent um, to drive the work within our district. Um, but with that being said, also at the building level, you know, I would advise school leaders, despite whatever external forces may attempt to intervene, to always keep student outcomes at the center of learning and to maintain a focus on students. And it, uh, it is also wise to expect and to anticipate some resistance and pushback related to this. Um, and just to not allow fear, as I say before, I continue to go back to that. I do not allow fear to drive my decision-making or thought process around leading our school, uh, nor have I ever done that, nor will I ever do so. Uh, so just to embrace the opportunity and do what is necessary to support your educators and, and keep the focus on student outcomes. Very good. Bravo. So uh, Christina, what would you say to teachers who are thinking about bringing this into their classrooms? I mean, we, we just completed working with the school district where we presented the 1619 project and all the resources. Teachers are excited. They're going to, you know, a lot of them have dabbled in it, have done some things in the classroom, but a lot of them have big plans for the fall. What advice do you have for them? How do you kick this off? I think my biggest piece of advice is to, um, do what's best for the students. And when we think about what type of text we put in front of them, what type of learning experiences we create for our students, they have to be our why. 
what's best for them has to guide every decision that we make. And one of the reasons that I'm very passionate about creating rich, deep, immersive learning experiences for students is because I didn't receive that as, as a young person, as a student, I didn't receive that. Um, so I strive to be the educator that I never had in the classroom and to put for my students content that is going to build, um, and I'm going to reference the words of Goldie Muhammad, that's gonna cultivate their genius that is going to have them build identity as a result of my coursework to become stronger advocates for themselves and others and to better understand how they exist within the world. Oh yes, Gold, Dr. Goldie Muhammad, um, her work is her. breaking and her mentor, Dr. Alfred Tatum, actually worked with us at University City High School to develop our literacy work. Oh, and wow. one of the things Dr. Tatum always said is students need to get smarter as a result of your instruction. <laughs> and if they're not, we're not doing our jobs. So I thought about, and, and what I would recommend to teachers is in what areas do you want students to get smarter? Mm -hmm. And then make sure that you are cultivating uh, their genius through rich learning experiences that are going to help them be smarter as a result of whatever that learning is, whatever the text is. And so I want my students to be stronger um, individuals, stronger human beings. I do want them to be more effective communicators. Um, but when I think five years down the road, when they have long left my classroom, I want them to be competitive and impressive no matter what room they're walking into. And when we're talking about the 1619 project and the work that, um, that it really delves into, that's life enriching work that has so many benefits outside of academics that I can't even, I can't even count all of the ways it enriches our students. So I encourage teachers to create those types of learning experiences that will enrich human beings and not just the academic side of student life. Beautiful. Yeah, that, see, this is why we love her. She's just, <laughs> <laughs> she encapsulates everything that excellent teachers really want to convey. They really want to get this across to their students. So thank you for bringing all of this forward for us today, Christina. I understand you have some examples from students, their reactions to being exposed to the 1619 Project. Um, now might be a good time to share that. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, I'm gonna share my screen actually. Okay, good. And what I am sharing with you, this is a quote um, that comes uh, from Rudine Sims Bishop. And I've talked about this before, but this is something that um, we definitely strive to achieve in all of our coursework to make sure that it is acting as windows, mirrors, and doors. A mirror that reflects the student's culture, and helps them build their identity, a window that will be a resource to offer a view into somebody else's experience and help them learn about the world around them, and then a door to provide access and opportunity to new experiences. So when we thought about this work, um, I am going to connect to Dr. Alfred Tatum's quote, and it is a rich quote, so I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to ask you guys just to reflect on it for a second. And Dr. Tatum stated, literacy instruction has to be wide enough and deep enough to counter an historical ugliness rooted in multiple forms of exploitation that has manifested into academic underperformance, social unrest, and personal and social suffocation for many students. Literacy also has to be wide enough to break new ground and to fashion new imaginations and realities. And I put this quote before you because the students in our district um, have a very interesting makeup where the majority of our students do not read and write on grade level, but our honor students are exceptional and they are comparable to students at some of the um, highly esteemed 
private schools and highly esteemed high schools in any state, in any area. I would put them up against any student anywhere. But we have a deep divide within our district where the white students shine brightly and the black and brown students have a historical level of underperformance, even in our honors class. So when I talk about my students, um, here, here, this is a picture of uh, my students that I was so honored to work with. Um, and we had to recruit and, and really get uh, diverse students to participate in the AP English Language and Composition course. And it was my responsibility as the teacher to make sure that they were successful. And we were chugging along throughout the year, doing a great job, and then the pandemic hit. And I had to figure out how to press on with my unit about the 1619 project while keeping students engaged in learning while we were quarantined and we were distanced from each other. So the work that we started, I had to find a way to continue. And the lessons that we really jumped into uh, really connected me to an article about ending curriculum violence. And it used to be called uh, teaching tolerance. And when I thought about this, I, I thought, how do I create this experience without doing harm? Making sure that my students have an opportunity to dive into this topic, um, which is dealing with hard history. And I had to really figure out a creative way to make that happen. So I thought, let me do it with them, not to them. And I thought about the powerful text in tandem with the powerful reading and writing instruction and how that would have significant influence on the lives of the students. And that again is a quote from Dr. Tatum. So what I'm gonna do is share a video with you from one of my students talking about um, the driving question for our entire unit of study. And what I ask students is, whose responsibility is it to teach students about race? And I'm going to cue up that video and I want you to think about that question for a second. Whose responsibility is it to teach students about race? Should that happen starting from the home? Should it start in school? Whose responsibility is it? So what I am sharing with you right now comes from my website and this website, um, I'm going to drop the link in the chat so that when you get an opportunity, you can um, peruse it, that you can dig into this a little deeper because there are so many different videos and reflections from students that participated in this coursework. And so it has their written accounts um, it has kind of like all of the text that we um, analyzed throughout our study. And then at the bottom of it, it has these wonderful images from um, the art installation we created. And then it has some audio series, their personal podcast. Mm -hmm. So if you are a person who is really curious about like how the students felt about all of this learning and how they connected with it, you can feel free to listen yourself. I am only gonna share one of these with you and this student's name is John and you will hear him introduce himself actually in the audio. And John is an interesting student, um, one of the most brilliant minds that I've ever had the, the privilege and honor to work with. Um, he is an exceptional learner and he's also um, a white male who has grown up in private school all of his life until he came to University City High School. That was his first experience in a public school, not only to, uh, it's his first experience with a diverse set of students to learn with and, and teachers also. So I'm going to play this. Let me make sure my audio, yeah, everything is ready. 
Hi, I'm John Ruland, and during the next five minutes or so, I'm going to talk about why it's important for all of us to suffer through the hard history, even though it's not exactly the most comfortable thing in the world. This past semester, um, my class explored the 1619 Project, which was a huge collection of essays, podcasts, and reports about race from the New York Times. It was headed by Nicole Hannah-Jones. Her project aimed to expose the myriad of ways that black people are still discriminated against in America. It delved very specifically into that, and it claimed that black people live out American values most of all through the contributions they made that were usually forced to the foundation of our country as we know it. We spent a lot of time on this as a class, and I think we sort of got used to the deep dive I mean, I fully expected to deal with a hard issue every day when I walked into the classroom, um, which begs the question, is school even the place for this kind of difficult, disheartening content? Should race even be discussed in school? Is it too hard? Is it too volatile? It's a very sensitive issue. Everyone has their own emotionally charged experience with it, including me. Would it be best to leave it to other institutions to deal with? And my answer is that race should be talked about in school. School is the perfect place to deal with this kind of thing because it's a place where objective truth can rule. It rises above the biases and the singular experiences of the home and the truth of any one person. The objective truth and this personal truth can work together in harmony. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission report was... Um, a study that came out of South Africa's response to apartheid. And they examined how we can use two kinds of truth in order to heal societies. And these truths work together to create change. And the two kinds of truth are factual truth, that's statistics, history, briefings, what indisputably happened. And then there's the healing truth, which places these facts, what happened, in the context of human relationships, how people experienced these things, how each person experienced these things for themselves. And with race in America, students live this context every day. They're full of experiences with race. But the Truth Reconciliation Commission showed me that in order to change things, a person has to have factual truth first in order to get at this healing truth which takes their experience that they have and applies it to these facts and creates something bigger. Uh, Teresa Coble did a TED Talk um, for the TEDx Gateway Arch, and she talked about how to forgive a large group of people as a society and to get past suffering and to get past um, wrongdoing, you have to know what went wrong. You have to understand it deeply. She said that we have to learn to be conveners and facilitators. We have to get good at having conversations about the things that divide us. Um, We have to hold all of the competing points of view together. This is where it gets messy. So what does this look like in class? It looks like Socratic seminars. It looks like debates. It looks like all these kinds of academic responses to a stimulus, you know, whether it's books, movements, research papers, the 1619 project as a whole. And when we pick apart these different sources, we do things like we debate and we write papers and that forces us to bridge our personal experiences with this factual information that we've taken apart and we've viewed objectively. Einstein kind of alluded to this balance between um, factual information and putting your own spin on it. He said that education is not the learning of facts, but the training of the mind to think. I mean, anyone can get facts anywhere. I can go through my day tomorrow and there will be facts that are shouted at me from every which way And I have to be able to filter all of it and to connect it to my own personal experience. How am I going to use it? If it's not clear, what I'm advocating for is not that race should only be talked about in school. I'm advocating for a partnership 
between school and home. I think in a good system, the student learns their truth and the family's truth, their experience through home. That's important. But then the student goes to school and learns about all the cold and hard facts, what actually happened. They learn about other people's experience, other people's opinions. They learn what really happened and they hear the extent of the controversy around it. And then, at least in my case, they bring it home. And I've talked to my mother and my father about the 1619 Project quite a bit at home. I'll come home rather disillusioned. It's full of a lot of bad news and things I, I didn't realize. And we talked it out. We had discussions about what it means to be white, how to draw a line between accepting the legacy of our country and our race's role in it, but also living our own lives independent from race looking to the future. We talk about how to do what we can to try to be part of the solution, not the problem. And in education, I've heard the phrase, the teacher-parent-student triangle talked about a lot. And I think it makes perfect sense. You have to have both sides of the story. You have to have both kinds of the truth, just like the TRC said, and just like Teresa Coble said. Um, so how does all of this connect to me, personally? How does all of this connect to my community? Um, hard history has a lot of roots in St. Louis. It's a very isolating place racially, you know, north, south. I'm lucky enough to live in a place with a mix of both races. My school represents both sides of Del Mar and both sides of Olive. Um, but given the geographical racism of the city, you know, it reaches back to redlining, it reaches back to the Federal Housing Administration. Um, and as the 1619 Project taught me, it reaches back a lot farther than that. Um, given that geographical racism, white and black people kind of have different geographical and social lives a lot of the time. As for my experience, I didn't really have a reason to go above 70 until very recently. Um, I live in North U City, but a sizable portion of my life, almost all of it, takes place south of where I live. Rare is the occasion when I have to turn north on Midland as opposed to going south. Most of my friends from U City and from my old school live south of me. Um, and my family lives in South U City or they live in the quote unquote wider suburbs to the west across the Missouri River. Um, UCHS has for sure opened my experiences up a lot. But what this project has taught me is that I need to be aware of my own experiences and I need to be aware of my own relationship to race because there always is a relationship to race, at least in this country. Um, this semester has dropped a bombshell and it's been hard to process all of the hard, saddening truths, um, especially for a person who considers myself kind of naturally optimistic. But what I've realized is that if I'm supposed to go out there and change things, I have to be completely open to the truth and completely open to the stories of other people. I didn't realize the extent that racism pervades the industry of farming and how that connects to the land ownership that we have today in cities. And I didn't realize how far deep racism goes with healthcare and how the different races do not have an equal opportunity to fair and quality healthcare in this country. Um, they say that education is the most powerful weapon, but it's more like the clothes on your back when you go into battle. You have to have it on before you can start fighting. And for an issue as substantial as race in a country as big and as old as America, they're pretty heavy clothes. We need to do a lot more work as a nation before we can call ourselves free from racism. And we need both kinds of truth in order to do it. I need to know what I'm talking about, but I also need to know who I am and why I'm even opening my mouth. So I know that that was a long clip, um, but I thought it was worth sharing and worth hearing his perspective. Um, so what did you what did you think about that? What stood out to you um, from John's words? You can type in the chat and 
um, Lisa, Shelley, uh, Mr. Peoples, feel free. I mean, what did you think about what John said? I loved what he said about, I need to be aware that there are other stories besides mine. You know, just, he had it a different way of saying it, but I need to be aware of other people's stories, I think is how he said it. Oh, Ellen commented. She says, I was curious about what he was getting from his parents' side, support or denial. Yeah, I think he said his parents helped him put it all into context and um, just kind of process through some of it. They were definitely supportive of our studies. They were supportive of him and just helped him kind of put it into place. And one of the biggest pieces of criticism um, is that people try to say that uh, using the 1619 project is one, indoctrinating students, and then two, it's teaching white students to be shameful of being white and trying to make them feel guilty for everything that's happening in the world. And that's just not true. Um, and so one of the things we talked about is that um, this is not something for us to own ourselves and, and say we're responsible for everything, but we are responsible with what we do with it in terms of how it impacts our future decisions, the way that we move in the world, the type of experiences we have for our children and for our peers, the types of discussions we have, how we vote, you know, how we actually move in the world today and in the future. And I think John and his family and the way that they supported each other through this learning is an example of that. You know, I, as I was listening to him, I mean, he it was so rich and there was so much there, but it, for me personally, and I think this is, this sounds like what his, it's his experience. I found it liberating. I did not find, I did not experience shame or, oh my God, what if, you know, I didn't look at it personally, like me personally, although it did give me an opportunity to, do my own soul searching and how do I operate in the world? And, you know, my, my privilege, um, I'm very aware of, and I'm not rich, but, you know, just, it just really was, uh, woke me up. And I, um, it's amazing to me that so many of us in the professional development program, we did also teachers, this was all new to them. You know, they didn't realize that racism was systemic. I mean, now it's, you know, so much has come to the surface and we are more woke than we have been. But I just think it is such a gift. You know, even if the story, it's, you know, the story, like I said earlier, when I was reading our mission statement, it's a gateway. It's like, I mean, I have learned so much about history. Most of us, you know, if you talk to people, their feelings about history, oh, it was just, you know, dates and events, promptly forgotten after a test, you know, not very satisfying. This to me is, just it goes deep and wide and is such a um it's it's an adventure it's a journey it's it's so rich and i think that's what i'm hearing from students there's so much there there's so much to unpack there's so many discussions to have you know the the parents the teacher and the student um you know where do they come together whose job is it it's all of us it's all of us it's not the teacher the student the parents you know all of us are responsible for waking each other up. So it was really powerful. Very much so. I do have a question. Oh, did you, I was looking at a comment made in here about from Ellen again, but how do you deal with parents that might not be as supportive that is as a good question. John's parents were? So one of the things, um, and I'm gonna ask Mr. Peoples to talk about this because we've had to handle it from, from different sides, me in the classroom and then him as the administrator. Um, but I will say one of the things is that partnership that John talked about um, was so important and inviting the parents to um, ask questions. I sent um, a copy of the magazine, the Pulitzer Center made sure that I had magazines for my students. So I sent them home and I made sure that the parents had a copy, that the students had a copy. Um, and then um, when the students were listening to the audio series, I asked the parents to listen with them. And when we were reading the essay, I communicated all of those details through our Google Classroom. 
to make sure the parents knew what we were learning, they could track it and they could join in. So I think it was a collaborative experience that really prepared the, the parents to engage because the students were taking it home. They we're talking about it at the dinner table. They were asking questions. They were researching and asking parents to, you know, take them different places. You know, I want to go to the African American History Museum. And, you know, the parents were like, what are you doing to my child? You know, because they are so passionate about this and they had never really been passionate about it before. So um, it was a collaborative experience. And I think that that prevented the parents from, you know, challenging it or being in opposition because they too were a part of the learning. Christina has a question. Her hand is up. Hi, Christina. Christina, you wanna ask her? I don't have a question. I was just gonna say that I teach elementary grade. And I mean, this is not, this is not something that can't be taught. I mean, it's definitely stuff that can be taught to any, any age kid. And I think that when teachers have the fear of upsetting parents, like, My kid gets, is told what his history is every single day by somebody that doesn't own his history. Like it's not his, that's not his history, but that's what they see. So like, we just have to remind ourselves that um, what we're doing is telling truth. We're not telling some kind of fake thing. And there are lots of books now. I mean, I, I would say that there's a ton of books and, and even some of these book, uh, the books, things that you're talking about specifically from the 1619 project are definitely readable for younger grades. Obviously not everything is, but like you just take it and adapt it. Um, and it's, and it's, there's lots of picture books, lots of chapter books, lots of excerpts, music, I would say as um, another event avenue to, to teach this stuff with for the younger grades. Cause that was the question in the chat. Yes. Mm -hmm. I love that. I, I like what you said too earlier, Christina, about, you know, we worry so much about how whites are gonna feel, that white <laughs> children, when they're exposed to this, when, in a, when children of color are constantly dealing with racial tension and racial issues, um, why aren't we worrying about protecting them? You know, so I'm, I am paraphrasing what you said, but you can- you And can no, I, I think that's true. And I mean, like, I do get afraid that um, when, white kids are like when my first set of my largest set of white kids that I had ever had was 12 white kids in a class and I was freaking out I wanted <laughs> all Mexican class because I was worried about that but I'm still gonna be me and they're still gonna hear it and I had my very most probably conservative family who would say um he loves you and he dislikes you all at the same time. And I was like, huh, and uh, interesting. And he's like, and he would say, I'm so excited. We're gonna get to learn the real history because on Monday we would read the history book. And then on Tuesday through Friday, we would read the rest of it, you know? And so I, and when my principal actually said, um, he's just not used to not having the privilege of his whiteness in a class. And, that's yeah, so and I think it. that with the question about like third to fourth grade um, stamped from the beginning is a text by um, Dr. Ibram X. Kendi. And he collaborated with Jason Reynolds to create stamped the remix. And so that is a text that is recommended for like middle schoolers. And they have now come out with another text that is an an easier way of introducing the concepts of race and um, how there are counter narratives created through history books for elementary children. So that would be a good way to, yeah, this is the adult, and I call it like the adult text um, that uh, Lisa is holding up. So if you are interested in like kind of broaching the topic in a way that is developmentally and age appropriate, I would recommend the stamped series for high school, middle and elementary school. Yeah, and then Christina is holding up the one that I would recommend for like middle school. Yeah, and that's the elementary um, text. Also, I wanna mention that uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones is in the process of writing uh, a 
elementary version of the 1619 project, which I believe yes. is going to be out in the fall. So that's another yes. resource that'll be yes. fabulous, I'm sure. Also, the um, Howard Zinn the Zinn Education Project is right. where you like you can take all that stuff and make it for uh, elementary grades. I've taught third through eighth grade. So Crystal Henning has been waiting patiently to say something, and I would like to hear from her before we move on to our next set of questions. Crystal, Great. would you like to share? Yeah, um, I just I had the opposite because um, I teach at a Title One in Arizona, um, which is um, and it's 100% free lunch and breakfast, and um, and I have about 80% or 75%. Um, Hispanic, and then 20% um, African American, and then the rest white. So I have completely the opposite. And um, a lot of my students um, who are Black really don't want to list here about their history. Um, and I always kind of was surprised about that because um, I would think you would want to talk about it and make sure that doesn't happen again. But then again, I, got, I had to figure out it's not about me. It has nothing to do about me and it has to do about them and how I can be more sensitive towards that, but also, you know, teach the subject. And um, so that's what I really want to get out of this is how do I be more sensitive to my students? How to, how do I, you know, understand, I mean, I, again, I can't understand where they're coming from. I'm, I'm like, my mom's 25% Native American, so I kind of have that part on there, but then the rest is, you know, mixed uh, European. So that's why I, I love the 1690 Project. Now I've always done cultural, you know, bicultural teaching and stuff like that. I've always done, I never use history books because my favorite book is, um, how history lied or how my teacher lied to me everything in the world history textbooks got wrong and I just don't like using them I like using primary sources so I have been teach I don't sugarcoat as what I said I don't sugarcoat my history um and sometimes they get really um like they feel like people are looking at them when I'm talking about that kind of part of history yeah and I had a student um a male student who said, like, I don't want to learn about this. Um, and he said that he's tired of us talking about slavery. And he feels like every time people talk about African Americans, it's always connected to slavery. And mm -hmm. I didn't even get to respond to him before the other students in the classroom responded to him. And what they told him was that, like, and these were Black girls who responded and talked about how empowering it was learning about the 1619 Project and all of the multiple ways Black people contributed to this country because we don't hear about that. We don't hear about the positive contributions. We don't hear about the perseverant nature of our people and the resilience and the power and the strength within our people. And they talked about that needing to be more of our story than slavery. And the 1619 Project really emphasizes all of the ways that we impacted this country in a positive way and the ways that we are still living, you know, um, off of the sacrifices and the blood, the sweat, the tears of our ancestors and of those that, that were enslaved. And so when we talked about like kind of flipping the narrative on its head and seeing how the system of slavery produced who we are today. And is that something that's negative or is that something that's super empowering? And it's like, if we could live through all of that and, and, and accomplish what we have today, what is too hard for us as a people? And there's joy in that, there's strength in that, there's power in that. And that came from the students. And after they talked and, and I just sat back like this and I let it the conversation ensue. And at the end of it, he was like, he thanked them for their perspective. And he said that it made him 
think differently about the entire project and about the work that we were doing. And he tuned in after that. He actually started participating after that. But before it, he was like, I don't want to talk about slavery. Wow. We had to highlight the fact that this is not talking about slavery. It's talking about the contributions of the enslaved. And I think that, that those are two different things. So I have a question for, uh, I know I feel like we, I want to hear Mike's voice too, but I, you know, I learned, one of the things I've learned about is in this, you know, for teachers, this is obviously a common knowledge, the C3, which is the college career and civics. You know, there's a whole discourse around civics and that part of the responsibility of teachers, particularly social studies teachers is to train or train, I should say, you know, to educate students to be in the world, to be responsible citizens, to make a difference. So are there examples, Christina, where the students took this work out into their communities, you know, talk to their families and friends and um, talk, you know, wrote to their representatives, went to city council meetings, you know, anything that, that kind of uh, sparked that interest for, for students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm gonna invite Mr. Peoples to um, answer this question. Okay, great. He's aware of some of them, even outside of me. Um, I do have a few students who engaged um, politicians and um, appealed to our school board to advocate for the teaching of this work in our curriculum. Um, but Mr. Peoples, you wanna add in from your perspective, what you know about this? Sure, absolutely, and thank you. Um, and, and um, to, in response to your question, Shelley, absolutely. Uh, we did have students who engaged in work with community partners um, as a result of uh, them being identified around their, um, their work with Mrs. Sneed in the 1619 project. Uh, I was approached uh, by a local company um, with a specialization in the development of uh, voice technology for Amazon Alexa. Okay. This group of students um, who were um, who participated in the 1619 learning under Mrs. Steed and in her course um, were invited to work with this uh, community partner and develop and enter content um, for an Amazon Alexa skill um, related to the Black Lives Matter movement at the time. Wow. So that if you're familiar with voice technology, I don't know if you are, if you have an Amazon uh, Alexa, if you have an Alexa in your home, right. um, can ask Alexa about a particular skill. And this, this company or community partner had purchased the domain rights to the Black Lives Matter skill. And um, those students worked with myself and this community partner to learn more about voice technology, but to also enter content under um, the Black Lives Matter skill for use under the Amazon Alexa platform. And in doing so, they were able to bring forth their learning and exposure to content um, as a result of their work with Christina in her class and actually contributed significant um, portions of the work and their, um, and what they learned and were exposed to, to the platform and entered that, that content into the skill and the skill actually did go live. So if you do happen to ask um, Alexa to tell me more about Black Lives Matter or to ask uh, Alexa, what does Black Lives Matter entail? Her response, the content you hear in her response, our students um, had a significant contribution in that wow. area. And that was tied directly to their work under the 1619 Project. And I would also like to say, one of the things that is incredibly frustrating for me as a, as a, as a building leader related to this is, you hear a recurring theme about, around fear. Um, and I just think there's something for us as a society to take away from this, this space uh, that we're in. And um, having had the opportunity to be in a position and act in a position of support for Christina and her students throughout their journey, the fear that drives these negative assumptions around how our students will be harmed if they're exposed to this type of learning um, have no basis in truth. And Think about, I mean, we have a shining example of this not being like, if you look at the outcomes of Christina's students and particularly the white students, none of them were harmed, <laughs> ridiculed, 
in any way as a result of their exposure to this learning. My office did not receive a single complaint or concern rose to my office from any parents of any students associated with this learning. Furthermore, there was no wide backlash in the community related to the learning and work around the 1619 project in our school, and I stand by that. So to all of the so-called detractors and people who have this deep-rooted fear of, and let's just undress this and say it and call it what it is, white students being harmed, targeted, or being made to carry shame or blame associated with this learning, that just simply was not the case as it relates to University City High School and our experience. We are a predominantly black high school of 85, or approximately 85% black with 10% white student population. However, when you look at that picture that Christina showed a few moments ago, there was a 50-50 makeup of white and black students in that class, okay? Those students produced incredible, incredible work. Um, and those students walked away from their experiences feeling empowered. They are better off as a result of their learning. And I feel they're better prepared to enter society and advocate for change and systemic um, growth um, and to combat racism and to act as leaders and agents of change in the interest of race and um, equity in our society. So um, I just don't see where there's a basis for this deep rooted fear other than you know, the negative assumption associated with challenging the historical narrative and placing the contributions of blacks at the center of the narrative um, and I just think, to me, that speaks to race, racist behavior and racist mindsets, the fear, you know, of this work. There's nothing that rests behind this other than, than the racist ideologies. Thank you, Mr. It's brilliant. And I put, I put the link in the chat to an article about the Alexa Skill app. Uh, I just put um, a link in the chat to an um, article, um, an op-ed that my, one of my students created um, to talk about the censoring, that, that it, the attempted censoring, we are fighting it. So it has not been um, voted on in Missouri yet, but they're trying to prevent the teaching of race, of, of the Zen project, of the 1619 project, of um, mm -hmm. the educational experts. So like all of this work that they are trying to group as critical race theory, um, they're trying to prevent that. So my student, Ian Feld, wrote an op-ed about it. Um, you might have read it. If you didn't, I invite you to, because, I mean, his words were just powerful. Yes. When I say they're his words, he wrote that in, like, 30 minutes. Um, <laughs> and then, because... That's unbelievable. So when you read it, it, it is pretty impressive, as well as um, I just put a link in there to the 1857 project. Um, about seven or eight of our students had um, their work um, published in the Gateway Journalism Review, and it was talking about the 1619 Project, and I let them write whatever they wanted, so, you know, I don't restrict my students, and that's one of the ways we can be sensitive to them and let them process through the learning in their own way. They developed documentaries at the end of our coursework, and they can do their documentaries on whatever, even though the unit centered around the study of the 1619 project, um, what the driving question asked about race and the discussion of it, they could take that in so many different ways, in so many different directions. So I had students develop documentaries about cultural appropriation. One student actually talked about the textbooks and how it um, othered Americans and how you know white Americans are considered just Americans, but anybody else is qualified. We're hyphenated or we're othered as African American, Mexican American, Asian American. And what it says is you're less American than white people, right? So he did his entire project on that. So just letting them take it in whatever direction they wanted to, that's one of the ways you can really be sensitive and empathetic when you are diving into this type of work um, and dealing with like hard histories, especially if you yourself have not lived these experiences. Let the students tell their stories. Let the people through which you're, you're discussing the, their history, let them tell their own stories. 
from their perspectives. And that's one way we can honor their voice and their experiences and their perspectives. And let them draw their own conclusions. I've heard you say that, you know, let the students present the material, let them interrogate it, research it, dispute it, you know, come up with their own conclusions. And I, I love what I've heard you say, Christina, you, said, you know, we're not there to teach them what to think, we're, te we're there to teach them how to think. And why is that so frightening? As, as Mike said, you know, why are parents so afraid of their, of their children learning how to think? You know, history is not, again, it's not about facts and dates. It's really about inquiry. You know, it's just a whole different paradigm. So um, the other thing I wanna say is, I don't, you know, I don't have the statistics, but I'm pretty sure most people who are so afraid of the 1619 Project have never cracked open the magazine and read the articles. And that, you know, to me is, you know, that's, that's appalling. I mean, you are drawing conclusions. This work, you know, you've used the term, Christina, that Nicole Hannah-Jones, she, it, it is a work of journalistic artistry. And I agree, you know, just the beauty of the language and it will choke you up to read even the opening passage about her father's love affair with the American flag. You know, somebody who was a sharecropper, who was, you know, not uh, not treated as a first-class citizen by any stretch, and still loved what the possibility of this country was. So, anyway, I don't want to hog the session, but I just, you know, so there's so much here to unpack and to and to appreciate. And when we're talking about teaching Black history, yes, Shelley, everything you said is so right, and um, I fell in love with the rhetoric, like the language. When you just look at the way that the text was crafted, the way that the, uh, the um, argument was unpacked by the historians, the economists, the journalists, the poets, the artists that collaborated to create it. Um, it's really hard to not appreciate. So when people don't appreciate it, you have to ask why. We don't have to dig that deep to figure out why, right? <laughs> Uh, but you do have to ask why, because it is a text. It's a, it's, um, it is just like anything else we would put before our students. So why are we trying to ban it? Right. You know, I could pull excerpts from, um, I mean, we read uh, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July from Frederick Douglass, and that's a part of many curricula. And yet that is like, that is, uh, deep and that it has many, uh, you know, ter terminologies that could be considered offensive, right? Um, the content is, uh, it's a deep exploration into, you know, why do Black people celebrate the 4th of July? What does, what is the symbolism behind it? How does it impact us as a nation? And when you look at the time in which it was written, you look at the, the orator, and you think about the audacity of them to ask him to speak, <laughs> you know, during the 4th of July celebration. And he's like, okay. And what he delivered was a huge, um, what people would say a check or, or a slap in the face, you know, to, to the um, white audiences. And, and yet we study it. We talk about it, right? We dive into it. And what is different about that than this? Mm -hmm. And we could talk about all of the um, texts, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and when you start talking about some of her texts that are talking about women's rights, right? Um, they are just as controversial, especially during that time in which they were created, and yet we study them. So why not this? I would like to follow up with something that you just sort of dropped in on a previous question. You. You mentioned critical race theory. And I continue to hear people address the 1619 Project as an example of critical race theory. And you have an interesting perspective on this. So would you, would you care to share um, how critical race theory correlates or does not correlate to this work? So I think um, too many people are accepting the category of critical race theory and the connection to the 1619 Project without actually challenging its connection. 
and asking how is the 1619 Project critical race theory? Because the, the definition of critical race theory involves law. It involves um, an agenda um, to actually enact changes in the way that we, you know, um, you know, structure our thoughts and understand the world in which we live. And Nicole Hannah Jones work is an argument um, from a journalist that wants us to reconsider the way that we feel about the place in which we live and the history about its creation. She is not trying to get us to um, change legal policies. You know, she's not lobbying for um, anything that involves agenda changing narratives um, in, in terms of legal narratives. So um, I do not believe that this is critical race theory. And if anyone does believe it, I just ask them to look at the definition of critical race theory and then read and study the 1619 project and then ask yourselves, does it fit? Does it fit? So Mike, we think that's all that needs to be done. And if you don't know what critical race theory is, don't just accept someone saying this is that because it's a red herring. It's, it's a distraction and it's just um, people trying to get people to attack something that they don't even understand. So I invite people to just look at the definition of critical race theory, study the project, and then judge for yourself. I think it's meant, it's meant to uh, oppose, you know, it's language that's used as a catch-all to oppose something. That's, that's how I hear it now. But, Absolutely. Um, I was going to ask you, Mike, how, are, how or why aren't more teachers at your high school teaching the 1619 Project? You know, Christina has certainly blazed a trail and created a path uh -huh. to invite others. What, what do you say about this? Well, well, what I, I say is now, um, given the attention and um, the positive reception associated with Christina's work, there are several now who wish they would have uh, uh, taught or embraced the learning initially. Um, but to begin, you know, this is interesting. We spoke about this yesterday. Christina, as, she, as stated before, is, as you all know, is an Engl English language arts teacher. She is not a, she is not a historian. Um, she is not a classically trained history teacher. However, um, she observed an opportunity and saw an intersection um, related to um, the piece, um, who was obviously, which was obviously submitted by a journalist, I think with uh, English language arts content in her background. And then she immersed herself in the 1619 Project and had an opportunity to learn and grow herself and naturally found herself in this lane. OK, our history department, several of them challenged um, the authenticity of the work and had their own issues with um, the 1619 project being used as a curriculum. So we had we engaged in conversations around the work. Um, I encouraged them to bring forward their concerns. And what I was told, and I did see some evidence of, is them infusing the work into various aspects of their teaching, but not embracing it to the degree that Christina did. Now, I think, you know, and I can only, I can only um, guess here um, that, that I, I think several of them were somewhat apprehensive um, and fearful of the potential response uh, to the content. Christina was the one who was courageous enough to take on this learning and embrace the work with the students. And she has now cleared a pathway, however, based on the success she had with the work for others to get on board now and continue the movement forward. So there's a school of thought associated with, you know, where we are with this, that think that um, works of, these na of this nature, such as the 1619 Project, Critical Race Theory, should be mandated as relates to schools and should it be mandatory learning for all? Um, I have never operated from that mindset. I, I think it should be encouraged. I think we should be encouraged to embrace the work and to move that forward for the benefit of our students. 
But mandates to me operate in the same capacity and space as do the people who rest on the other end of the spectrum who are seeking to ban the material. I think we encourage the work uh, because I think this work and this learning is a matter of the heart. I would hope that through encouragement and seeing the success that we have, that we would be compelled or feel drawn toward the work and the need to expose our students to more authentic um, historical accounts. So in a nutshell, I think moving forward and I, my sincere hope is that for years to come at University City High School, we'll begin to see more evidence of the implementation of Nicole Hannah Jones work in future and, and at quite honestly, all content areas. I don't think the 1619 project has to be restricted to simply his um, social studies and English language arts. I think there are aspects of mathematics and science that we can we can infuse this work uh, this um, into the into those content areas, and our students can uh, be you know be exposed to um, these narratives around um, African slaves in our country in those other content areas as well. Yes, so um, in addition to what Mr. People said, it will be um, a part of our curriculum for our African American studies course next year. Um, it is being used in our US history um, course um, for next year, and, and this is the plan, as well as some of the English teachers have used parts of it. Um, and so we are finding ways to be able to connect it outside of just social studies because it really is a work of art and I'm hoping that journalism students will be able to really dive into the work as a as an example of the power of your words and the the power of the platform of a journalist. So I think it has so many implications um, for our future work and I'm just excited to keep going. I never thought <laughs> the work that we started you know last school year would still be relevant. And um, when I was listening to um, the audio clippings from my students, I was kind of um, I was kind of uh, speechless and in awe of the fact that I broached that that question to them just about teaching race and whose responsibility is it. Should this be before all of this started happening in schools and before they started, um, you know, attacking what we teach and trying to you know, put these bills forth to restrict what we teach and how relevant for students to think about it, study it, talk about it before it actually happened. Even before George Floyd's murder, we talked about do Black Lives Matter, you know, and what evidence is there in this country um, for your answer, whether you answer yes or no. Um, when we just talked about it all and the students said that it really helped them to live through last summer and all that was happening in the world. And I can only imagine that it's still happening today because now we have a whole new group of students that is wanting to do some work with the 1619 Project and lobby legislatures to not censor, censor their teachers and to not restrict what is being taught in the schools. I just wanted to uh, point out that I posted a link to the full issue of the New York Times Magazine of the 1619 Project as well as this uh, accompanying broadsheet. And then in particular, Nicole Hannah Jones's opening article, The Idea of America, which I often say, if you read nothing else in the magazine, although I encourage you to read cover to cover, read that article. It's, it'll, it is life altering. So, so there's gonna be uh, questions from our, our uh, attendees today, but I, I wanna get to like two last questions on what we hoped we could Get to today. Um, this has been such a such a gift. I, I can't tell you. My heart is just bursting. Um, relationships between your students in the classroom. Did you witness any any changes, Christina, as you walked through this with them? So yes, and I'm actually going to um, not answer that. I'm going to let my student answer that. This clip is much shorter, so it's not uh, nine minutes long. Let's hear from Jaden. Um, and this is um, one of the young ladies, she just graduated, but she was in that class actually with John. Um, so I'm gonna let her speak. So with that, I'm actually gonna invite Jaden Smith 
who was one of my students to join into the discussion. And Jaden, you can um, say whatever it is that you would like to um, communicate about our work and also the work you created throughout our process. Okay. Hi, Adore. I'm Jaden. Um, well, the first thing I want to say, as being one of the students who was learning about the 1619 project, um, the class I was in, I mean, I guess you could say it was diverse. It was like majority white, but black students in in it. And the first thing that the learning about the project did was bring us closer together in a way where learning about just typical slavery couldn't do. Like in the past, when you learn about these things, you wouldn't really connect it to the present or how it impacts everyone today. But it was like learning about the 1619 project, everyone learned a little bit more about themselves. Like me and the other black students, we were able to learn more about our past and just learn more about how even today we're still being oppressed, even if you can't see it. And some of my white classmates, one of the biggest things for them was learning about their privilege and just learning how them all could be so impactful. And um, yeah, it really brought us closer. It allowed us to really dive into like some deep stuff together. And um, for me personally, I really enjoyed it because stuff like the 1619 Project would be just stuff like I talk about at home with my parents or just stuff I talk about amongst other friends and things like that. And you don't really get to talk about stuff like that in school or have something so controversial be brought up in school. And I think with it being talked about in the classroom, it showed you it's not controversial at all. It's just the truth. It's our history. It's facts. And it needs to be discussed and dissected. And it has um, it's great benefits to learning about something so heavy, like the 1619 Project. It's really thorough. Um, it's not just something you can just do in a day. It's It has so many like different levels to it and branches. And um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. And I think it needs to be talked about more. And I think it needs to be talked about everywhere. I think every school should dedicate a semester to learn about the 1619 Project. It, it does open your eyes and um, fully makes you aware of where we are today and how none of it is coincidental. It's all a result of slavery and it's all just one big ripple effect and you can't escape it. So you might as well learn about it. <laughs> Jaden, can you speak briefly to um, the project that you created? Um, after we got done learning, it turned into like, a, um, I guess, project based learning where we were allowed to do our own thing with it basically after learning about everything just kind of taking it to your own hands and pick whatever topic connected with you the most and create either a documentary or a podcast on it i chose a documentary and my documentary focused on discrimination colorism and hair discrimination that black women face um i chose this topic one i'm a black woman two i face hair discrimination and colorism is like one of the most prominent um, things in the black community today that isn't talked about often, or at least not often enough. So mine was really close to home for me. Um, I had all my friends help me with it. I had all my friends give me their own personal stories with colorism. Um, I had my friends tell me their own personal stories with discrimination, hair discrimination. And I think what made my story so I mean, I'm sorry, my documentary so well taken is because it wasn't coming from me. Like I just really grouped together everyone's stories so that other people could see it. And um, I, I had a lot of fun doing it. It meant a lot to me, still does. And I got a lot, like great responses from it. A lot of people telling me that it helped them or it educated them more. I had a lot of my fellow dark skinned friends that were telling me how like, they felt represented and they felt heard because they don't get to talk about that kind of stuff often. It's brushed off to the side a little bit. And yeah, I I was very grateful for the chance to get to make something like that. Like I said, it's just stuff that you talk about at home or just stuff 
you know, bring it to the classroom, basically. So being able to bring it to the classroom and share it with so many different peoples, I I really love the chance to do that. So um, you got to see my wonderful superintendent in that clip, Dr. Sharonica Harden Bartley, um, who is such a great supporter of the students, of the teachers, and of this work. Um, we strongly believe in social justice and creating learning experiences to help stu students cultivate their voice and their sense of agency. Um, so Jaden said, I mean, it brought them together and you kind of heard her words from her perspective. It looks like we uh, are coming to the close of this. So I'll close with the final question to Mike and ask you, what is the implication of not teaching this work? What, what do we miss if we don't do this? Well, I think we miss an incredible opportunity. And um, I think within the context of your question, you know, I'd like to, to actually expand the question to, to encompass the notion of us banning this work that, you know, um, because that is a reality in our nation that we're cu currently faced with. Uh, the president proposing a, um, an executive order that bans the teaching of this work. 22 attorneys general who have come out openly um, in a poll and expressed their opposition to the 1619 project in that failed attempt to lump together everything with critical race theory. Uh, when you look and see <clears throat> senators, state representatives um, who have been drawn toward this potential movement to ban the work, I think you have to look at that to me and it brings extreme concern to me. Um, if we are a free society <laughs> that we profess to be, um, I think the appropriate thing to do in this space is to encourage the critique of the 1619 project. We're not saying that everyone has to agree with uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones' stance or her perspectives, but I think we, we encourage a healthy debate and critique of the material. To me, that is what is American. Um, that is what is indicative of a free society. But to move to the point of discussing, introducing orders and legislation that bans this work uh, to me is the antithesis of a free society and would establish an incredibly dangerous precedent in our country. And for all of those individuals who um, have expressed this deeply rooted fear associated with introducing our students, our young minds and learners to this work that is rooted in an assumption around a negative outcome, there is no evidence to support that claim. You, however, have now the journey of, of Mrs. Sneed, along with her students and their exposure to the work, both black and white, from every area of the socioeconomic spectrum you can imagine, who embarked upon this journey together and emerged with incredibly powerful outcomes for our students that liberated them in their thinking. We have evidence to support that outcome. I encourage everyone to use the story around the journey at University City High School to combat these narratives and this thinking around the harm that can be done by introducing this work to the minds of our young learners. Um, and we are here to support and, and, and serve as advocates. I am most definitely as a school leader. Um, so I, I just wanna, I, I really, really want to encourage everyone to abandon the negative thinking, the fear, and take a step forward and have the courage to embrace the work and give the students an opportunity. Don't, don't, don't withhold this uh, from our students to their peril. Let's embrace this opportunity for our students. Even if we were robbed of these opportunities growing up or we didn't have these opportunities to learn and have these discussions in schools, we are at a space and time now where our students and young minds do have these opportunities. So let's embrace that and look for and expect the positive outcomes that can emerge from this, as opposed to this, uh, the negative thinking and around this impending racial explosion and division that will occur as a result of it. Because I personally think that that will not happen. I don't see any evidence to support that claim. And I've had the experience as a school leader to lead a school through this space while we worked with the discomfort, 
um, associated with conversations around race, equity, and our history. And to me, discomfort now is synonymous with growth as opposed to any type of harm that has occurred. So let's embrace the, the discomfort together and work through that uh, with healthy dialogue and continuing to challenge each other's perspectives as human beings. Thank you so much, Mr. Peoples. Thank you. Um, very well said. Um, and I just wanted to respond to the question in the chat um, about the resources for ELLs. Um, and when we think about English language learners, um, this text is for them also. Um, and what I encourage is read it with them and then let them listen to the audio series um, in tandem with the essays, analyze the, vis the, the visual images, and then write about it in their own language and share in their own, their home language, how they are thinking through, processing through, reflecting through the text. And many times we look for resources for our ELL students instead of realizing they are the resources. And that's that funds of knowledge approach where you bridge that home language and what their experiences with, within the home with what's happening in the schools. So let them write about it, however it comes out, and then use that as a text to explore the topic and the wonderings and the thought processes of the students. So their writing can actually be the resources that you're using to engage with this work. That's my recommendation. So Lisa put our contact information in the chat. You know, anyone who is curious, interested, how would a professional development program work at our school um, with our teachers? We'd, we'd love to chat with you. We're, we're actually doing, we're starting a program in the fall with a alternative high school in Phoenix. And we're aware of some of the obstacles that Mike talked about and some of the scary bills that are uh, now one is a line item in the, in the state budget. And we're proceeding. You know, we are marching forward. So uh, look out, look out state of Arizona. <laughs> so um, anyway, I get, I'd like to thank uh, Christina Sneed and Mike Peoples uh, for being here today and for the Arizona Historical Society for hosting us and giving us this platform. It was really uh, such a rich conversation. I, I'm so glad it was recorded. <laughs> That's all I could say. So um I don't know, Todd, anything you want to say to close? Otherwise, I think we're, I think we're good. This was great. I just, I just want to say thank you to all that showed up today on Juneteenth. Um, we uh, hope that you'll stay. Um, all, all of um, our folks that joined today um, in, in the conversation, I hope, we hope that you'll stay connected with um, Arizona Historical Society in our social media and um, go to our website to see for, you know, what other things are coming up. Excellent presentation, thank you all. Yeah, thank you. This is really a privilege. Very much so. I'm just a little verklempt. <laughs> <laughs> is somebody recording?